Is it time for Kansas to ban suspending driver's licenses for unpaid fines and court fees? Plus, a move to overturn marijuana convictions in Kansas, springing potentially thousands from state prisons. And an appeal from a grieving mother to change how the state investigates officer-involved shootings. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. A proposal before lawmakers this week would change when and how the state investigates officer involved shootings, specifically who would do the investigation and how information from the investigation is released to the public. Cake's Greg Miller explains. Lisa Finch stood before state lawmakers demanding change. Families of the victim are put out right away to be dissected and scrutinized by the public. Police shot and killed her son Andrew during a swatting hoax in 2017. Details of the killing weren't released for months, including the officer's name who opened fire. His mother says that isn't right. KBI did not question the victim's family. KBI stuck with visiting with law enforcement. It's law enforcement investigating law enforcement in a very closed area. She and others want that to change and are supporting a House bill that would require two outside investigations into deadly police shootings. It also aims to make more evidence public even if officers are not charged. We have no problem with an outside agency um, working uh, that particular case. Sedgwick County Sheriff Jeff Easter did not investigate the Finch case, but his agency has investigated plenty of others. He says the bill is missing details, including how long investigators would have to wait for other agencies during a time sensitive case. The scene is usually very chaotic. You have a lot of witnesses. You have evidence to secure, depending on whether the suspect has escaped, uh, those type of things. Is this bill saying that we got to wait for two investigators to get there from somewhere else. But Finch insists the current setup is not working. Why are the police allowed to hide behind their shield? And joining me on the desk this week to discuss this and more, we have State Representative Jim Ward, Democrat from Wichita, and State Representative Ken Rogers, Republican from Agra. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is an issue that has been ongoing now for some time. Uh, certainly a lot of activists in the Wichita area really pushing for some changes. Is there an appetite for that at the state level? I do think there's to definitely investigate. This is one of those issues that can tear a community apart, as we saw with the, the case that the, the lady, the mother talked about. You got two different things going on. First of all, you've got to have confidence in your police department. And all good police officers will tell you their job is made better when there's trust in the community because that is the glue that makes their job work. On the other hand, when something does happen, everybody has an interest to make sure that the rules are followed and the law is enforced equally, whether it be a law enforcement officer or not. And there is no right answer, there's a better answer than the way we do it now. Now, when I spoke with Jeff Easter about this bill, one of the things that he, one of the concerns he raised was smaller towns throughout Kansas. He's like, in my department, we've got plenty of people. We can lock a scene down if we have to, right. that sort of thing. Although the longer the time passes, the more difficult it becomes. But smaller communities where you only have a couple of officers, that becomes a much bigger issue. Do you see a, this being useful in more rural parts of Kansas, Ken? Well, I, I, I think there's you know, a lot more questions to be asked. I mean, I think the conversation is fine. I also see that the, the one who brought the bill is from a metro area, from Johnson County, and so they, would, they in Sedgwick County would have a lot more issues. I think if, if we put those restrictions of having a couple of investigators come in from like the area that I represent, which is in, in central and western Kansas, that might impede some situations as well. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth, definitely worth the conversation, but I think, uh, you know, as Representative Ward said, I mean, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, w that the communities have confidence in their, uh, in their police departments and sheriff's departments and uh, that, you know, everybody's trying, and, and, and any case like this would be solved as quickly as possible. There, there, there are recognized investigation techniques and the way you look for sources and how you collect evidence and who you interview whether regardless of who the suspect is that an independent agency could review and ensure 
whether it be the sheriff, obviously you would want your partner in a situation to investigate, but you can do things to ensure the investigation was conducted based on the best evidence available and the standards um, without having to stop everything and wait for people to come from out of town. There are ways to right. do that. And like I said, I don't know anybody in big communities that solved the problem, but we should continue to try to get better at it so we can continue to build that trust in communities that we have to have that when any kind of crime happens, but particularly when a law enforcement officer is in, involved with the shooting death. Well, and we were talking before the show, Ken, about how at this point in the session, a lot of these hearings and things that we're seeing are really more about the conversation than about a bill passing at this point. I think it's what you find in, in, in situations like this that can be uh, very emotionally charged. It starts the process. And uh, a lot of times uh, bills you know, come and, you know, they come and go, they, or they, they kind of get reinvigorated. And so if something doesn't happen now, it may get reintroduced in the next session and continue to build. And, and, and I think almost everybody in any situation wants to build consensus to try to, to, try to uh, get, things, uh, get things done. And, and we have, we're dealing with so many issues. Like this was a bill that didn't come before any committee I'm on, so I'm trying to learn exactly, you know, what, what the end result is, is wanted. Well, it's certainly not the only contentious issue at the State House this week. Another one raising eyebrows, a move to bring state law into agreement with federal law on the minimum age to buy tobacco. It's moving to the full House floor for debate now, but it contains some controversial additions, including major limitations on vape products. Corinne Griffith from KSN's Capitol Bureau breaks it down for us. President Trump signed a federal law that makes it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to purchase tobacco products. However, the proposed Kansas bill would take that a step further. The proposed bill would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to purchase or possess tobacco products. It would also eliminate smoking inside state casinos. Tobacco vending machines would also be illegal, and the bill also targets vaping. Only flavors allowed by the FDA would be legal in Kansas. Supporters of the bill hope this will be a turning point for young smokers. So that uh, the 18, 19, 20 year olds that are smoking or using vaping products, they will have an opportunity to, to get some assistance in quitting. As of now, if the bill passes through the full legislature, it will go into effect July 1st of 2021. Lawmakers say this will give those 21 and under some time to quit smoking before the law changes. The bill will now move on to the full House for discussion and a vote. At the Capitol, I'm Corinne Griffith. And really, it was the vaping portions of this bill, I think, that drew the most uh, side looks, shall we say. Um, I was actually kind of surprised at how big that hearing ended up being as far as this issue went. Well, and I, I talked to the Attorney General today to kind of get an update, too, mm -hmm. on because he has some of those proposals of, of, of what he wants to see done. And, and, and he and I, you know, I, I guess I, I look at it, you know, right now it's 18. Uh, the Fed's now voted to 21. It's probably going to happen, but I still believe it's a state's rights issue, and the state should decide what happens. Now, that aside, vaping has came upon us really quickly. And uh, I think we all share a concern of flavors like bubble gum or some of those things we just saw. Uh, that's, a, that's a concern. But I think what's, what's happened is the movement has, has gone so far that we're probably just going to have to uh, have to comply and it's going to happen. But, but you're right. I mean, vaping is one that, that uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't smoke and, and I would, you know, but, but on the other hand, what we've done with, with uh, you know, trying to utilize tobacco taxes and other taxes like that to, to pay for things, you know, we, we, we've got to make a decision of what, you know, what for sure we're going to do as far as from a state standpoint. You know, while we want to encourage people to quit, we're also trying to pay for some things using uh, some of those taxes. Interesting point. Vaping is an interesting phenomenon. It mm -hmm. really was created as an alternative to smoking, mm -hmm. that you could do that, and, and that if you think about it, common sense, it's flawed. The problem with cigarettes is nicotine, and vaping is another delivery system for nicotine and all of the products that go around nicotine. Um, and, and you can tell, just like with cigarettes, remember about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they were marketing cigarettes to kids. And that Joe Cool camo with the big sunglasses, that was for kids. Now, I guarantee you, no 30-year-old person is going into a store to buy bubblegum vaping. 
Well, I would. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've spoken with vape, vape shop owners just in this last week. Yeah, I'm not going to. I want to see that a 98 real life. Ninety-eight percent of their sales are the flavored vape I, flavors. In fact, I sat kids. there and watched a 76-year-old woman buy vape juice that was vanilla ice cream. Oh. I just, <laughs> but that's not bubblegum. I think. You know, oh. <laughs> I, I, well, and I think some of those flavors, but I, no. and I think that that's what of. I think some, you know, thought that vaping would mm -hmm. be a way to help them mm -hmm. uh, limit their smoking. But uh, some of those uh, flavors may encourage even more because we're con we, we're continuously research wow. of of what vaping can do to to, to lungs. And it's kids. I mean, it's really kids that were. Mm -hmm. Even though eighteen-year-olds can go to war, and I recognize that, and respect that. They're the target audience, mm -hmm. and if we can get the price up high enough that they can't afford it, or if we can make it harder for them to get these products, we have a better chance of them never joining the group that smoke or are addicted to the vaping type of thing. So I'm open to the conversation. But what about the old economic argument that as long as there is a demand, somebody will find a way to supply it? Cigarettes, <laughs> if used correctly, kill you, period. Okay, this is a product that is created, if you use it absolutely correctly, it kills you. It causes heart disease, it causes lung problems, it causes cancer. Do we as a community have a right? Because since we, as the government, provide a huge piece of health care, particularly mm -hmm. critical care at mm -hmm. the end of we have a duty and responsibility to make it difficult for those who have not to get these kind of products, or at least have to work damn hard, um, pardon me, very hard to do it. <laughs> well, and it's true, but you know, it comes back to, uh, you know, as a, as a free society, uh, you know, and, and, and we're still, we're, most of us are capitalists, regardless of what, you know, it, it, you're exactly right. If there is a market for it, people will find a way, and you know, whoever thought vaping would have come, and there may be something else that I'm sure they're working on the next, the next situation because of uh, you know just the, the the sheer dollar amount that that generates. Well, cocaine has a market. We we and alcohol we do the same thing too. We say you have to yeah. be a certain age before yeah. we'll allow you to participate in that market. And I just think what we're discussing is the weight and how much. Mm -hmm. At far is this one of those products like alcohol? It's clearly not a cocaine kind of. Yeah. Thing. But it, is this more like alcohol rather than other substances? Mm -hmm. I, I fall on the line. It's more like alcohol, but yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. open to the conversation. A lot of, I mean, there's still, there's well, so that's many exactly questions. it. As you spoke earlier, it is a conversation at this point. Right. Yeah. I don't think we're going to do any banning this year. I no. doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, something else that is up involves smoking as well, but marijuana, not tobacco. Is it time for Kansas to stop treating marijuana possession as a felony? The move could have major implications for the state's prison crowding problem. We go back to KSN's Corinne Griffith for the details. The proposed bill would not only remove the felony violation for possession of marijuana charges, but it would also release the people convicted of it. Currently in Kansas, if a person is charged with possession of marijuana three times, they can be charged with a level five felony crime. The penalty? Up to three and a half years in prison and up to a $100,000 fine. This bill would change that, making possession of marijuana a misdemeanor regardless of the number of times they are found with it. The penalty? Up to one year in prison and a fine of up to $2,500. The bill would also order the release of some inmates convicted only of felony possession of marijuana in Kansas and no other charges. Prison isn't the place for people with for drug convictions. That may, treatment may be necessary in some cases, but imprisonment is really not doing anybody any good. Sponsors of the bill say less than 10 prisoners would be released and sentencing for less than 200 others would be reduced. Opponents of the bill say releasing people from prison creates logistical problems. For example, if a person was initially charged with a serious offense but took a plea deal and was then only charged with possession of marijuana, would they also be released under this bill? That has a lot of problems that could interfere with treatment programs that have been set up for them and, and other things that is being done to help them along their path. Lawmakers plan to take action on this bill on Monday. At the Capitol, I'm Corinne Griffith. And the introduction of this bill comes on the heels of a discussion in Kansas City led by the mayor there of doing something very similar. Is this something that is workable in Kansas right now? Yes. Yes? Absolutely. Why? Because it's, I, I'm sorry, it's legal in 20 states now, including Oklahoma and Colorado. Um, and what we're talking about is third-time offense. Now, should we have more 
treatment options. We can debate whether marijuana is a drug as we categorized mm -hmm. it for years or something else that many states are at. But today, just look at the law today. It is wrong to use the bed space we need for violent criminals for people who use marijuana addictively because this is a third time offense. Well, the first one's a misdemeanor, the second one's a misdemeanor, the third one they can charge as a felony. Mm -hmm. In my experience, usually it's not done by itself. There's usually something else that that enhances. So there's two issues here. First of all, going forward, if you're on a third time offense, should you be a felon? And the second bucket of issues is, what if I'm in prison now on a third time misdemeanor or mi marijuana possession? How do you treat me? Because you're treating me different than somebody who gets through the crime. Um, the second part is much more problematic than the first part, I think. Okay. I mean, if we would open this up, I mean, yes, we can look at Colorado and we can say there's a lot of great things, but there's a lot of untold stories I think that we're not learning. Now, uh, my colleague and I probably disagree on this. Uh, I'm not an attorney, though, so, you know, but uh, uh, we, we, have, we have worked on this the last few years. I, I don't see this issue really going anywhere. I, I just don't think... Uh, that there's enough support to change some things. I know that they're working on some sentencing guidelines for, for mm -hmm. various things. Um, you know, we, we did, was it last year, two years ago, we, we, we reduced some of those. And, and, and I understand, you know, Representative Ward's, you know, we, we, have, we have an issue in our prison system. We, we are overcrowded in some places. There's discussions about building a new prison. So we do have to look at, at some of those situations. And, you know, the law is the law. That's the other thing. And, you know, so if, if, if one thing, you know, well, it's maybe not as serious as it should be, well, then what's the next thing? And then, and, I mean, we, we, we could spend all our time in Topeka uh, determining uh, what we think is, uh, is, is, you know, uh, 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 different crimes. And, of course, we do that all the time. So I just don't... Uh, you know, I think that's that's something that I look forward to the debate on Monday. We may be there a while. <laughs> I think if we put, I think if we put, I know, I mean, I feel, I say no, I, I feel very, very strongly saying if we put medical marijuana on the ballot, it would pass with 60 or 70 percent. I go into nursing homes when I was running statewide and ask that question. I'm just curious. I'm an old prosecutor. I'm learning more about this. They all, they all knew somebody who would benefit from marijuana. I think recreational marijuana on the lines of Oklahoma or Colorado would be very competitive in this. That's an issue one. Now you ask yourself, do we really want to use what is eighteen, twenty-two thousand dollar a year prison bed space for potheads? Is that really how we want our bed space to be used, especially when we are way over the number of people in our prison system? And to say, okay, well let's build a new prison so we can do that, I think that's the wrong priorities. I do. All right. While well, talking about priorities, what about when you are driving? What is your priority, the road or your cell phone? Distracted driving injuries and injures and kills hundreds of people every year. Now, some want to ban all handheld cell phone use while behind the wheel. Cake's Eli Higgins shows us how the idea would work. Not one, not two, but a handful of drivers on their phones is what we witnessed in just a matter of minutes at a busy Wichita intersection. A state bill, if passed, would look to end distracted driving in Kansas by getting people to put down their phones. A local driving instructor says this law is needed. But when you're talking, just even talking on the phone, whether it's handheld or not, your mind is either focused on the communication or the conversation or it's on driving. The brain doesn't multitask very well. The proposed law would make holding your phone or supporting it with any part of your body illegal while driving a car. My hope is that it passes and it cuts down on traffic crashes and fatalities. But some people like Kenneth Husky think it might not be the best solution. Ban the dolls really shouldn't happen because you got law enforcement and everything else that gets to do that. Is, what's the difference? And under the new proposal, if you get caught, it wouldn't be cheap. The fine for using your phone would start at $60 for the first offense, then $120 for the second, and $250 for each time after that. Johnson says that while no law will completely prevent distracted driving, he thinks this would be a good start. Even Husky agrees the most important thing is saving lives. Just be safe. You know, think, think of your life before a phone call or a text. Now this isn't the first time we've seen a bill like this introduced in Kansas seems to be part of that ongoing conversation we talked about earlier. Are we closer now? Because I know the Kansas Highway Patrol, they release a, a list every year 
of causes of fatal accidents. The number of fatalities have jumped in the last couple of years in the state, and most of that is due to distracting dri distracted driving, primarily cell phones. Well, I understand, and, and in fact, coming here to record this, almost everybody around me had their phone or looking down, coming down on the interstate, uh, an out-of-state guy was driving slow. I, so I bet he's on his phone, sure enough. He was driving, you know, at 80-some mile an hour, looking down at his phone. Um, you know, we, we, we in the cell phone companies can make technological changes to where you can do it hands-free. And I understand there's also been studies that say uh, if you drive when you're too tired, it's like driving drunk. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think, again, this is one of those, Pilar, that, that is a point of discussion, but, you know, our, where we're going to go with it, it's going to be very difficult because I think probably many of us in the legislature may be guilty of this, you know, of, of doing that. Well, a lot of officers are, <laughs> police officers are as and, well. And that, I have seen that too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, just to be clear, it's illegal in Kansas to text and drive. Yes. We already yes. have an yes. offense mm -hmm. against that. Um, Distracted driving is a whole list of things. Yes. Playing with your radio is a distracted driving. Right. Behind, reaching behind you to get a drink, uh, not a drink drink, but a, a, a non-alcoholic <laughs> beverage. Water bottle. Water bottle. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that distract drivers. Um, and this is tied to our first topic, because if you make this illegal, people are going to keep doing it. And they're going to get the tickets, and they're going to get their license suspended. And so when you make a law that will be universally ignored, I think, no. because people are going to still talk on their telephone. You're creating a whole nother set of problems. Um, it's illegal to text, and that's what they should enforce. And, and you should, on that little clip, there's like at least three people <laughs> right. that were texting and breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And so let's enforce that law and see if that doesn't drive down the, the distracted driving offenses before we prohibit all touching of your cell phone. I just think that's... And I think with technology, I, again, I think this is an issue that a absolutely, but but the cars today have that whole situation built in with Bluetooth and, and right on the phone. I can, you know, if I have it lined up, I can hit one button and make several calls and, and still, you know, and I have uh, different things that if I do somehow veer, it pulls my car back. Mm -hmm. Now, I know not everybody has that, but, but that is where technology is moving. And so I think we need to be careful. A lot of these things, you know, are the nanny state that a lot of folks really don't want to don't want to go down I, I believe anyway. no no texting it's illegal right. you can't read your um, emails <laughs> you know just common sense mm -hmm. if, if people you do, would pull, pull off the side I do I pull off the side yeah, of the I road. do too I do mm -hmm. I do too because yeah. I don't want to be one of those statistics <laughs> well statistics are going to lead us into our next story because the statistics around suspended driver's licenses are pretty interesting here in Kansas. You know, if you're supposed, if you're going to drive, you're supposed to have a license. But as we've been talking about for a while now, tens of thousands of Kansans licenses are suspended, often because of unpaid fees and fines. This last week, they took their concerns to state lawmakers, calling the practice a poverty tax, as I showed in this report I filed with Cake News. Since I do not have a driver's license, I had to move back in with my parents. And at 44 years old, I am completely reliant on them to drive me wherever I need to go. Tuesday, state lawmakers heard story after story of Kansans struggling to get out from under a suspended driver's license. Get my daughter to school, and as far as late night shifts, working third shift, no one wants to get up in the middle of the night and take you to work. Some of them with suspensions decades long. Kansas has one of the highest rates of suspended driver's licenses in the country, as we've shown you in our series of Cake News investigations. In Wichita, we have over 51,000 families that are suffering economic hardship and financial distress due to suspension and revocations of driver's license. Of course, we all know, and it's the Bible teaches, if you don't work, you don't eat. These Kansans are asking lawmakers to follow the lead of states like Virginia in banning the practice of suspending driver's licenses for unpaid fines and fees, some not even related to driving. To me, this bill is punitive and is counterproductive and it disproportionately affects a lot of people with low incomes. The bill would be retroactive, wiping out the majority, but not all, of the 213 plus currently suspended licenses in Kansas. Unfortunately, but you know, not surprisingly, um, this type of punishment falls on the backs of low income communities and people of color. Uh, so essentially, HB 2434 is a big step forward to addressing issues of income inequality 
and racial justice. Now, this is a third bill to come out of this issue, but it's definitely the most wide changing. It would completely change the state's policy as far as suspending driver's licenses. It also seemed to be the one that had the most questions raised as far as lawmakers having concerns about it. Is this something that is being talked, uh, talked about beyond the committees themselves right now? I would go um, with yes. There's a very big concern that too many people in Kansas are suspended, which means it's harder to get insurance, which puts other folks at risk. And I, I personally am categorically against using law enforcement as a revenue collection or to fill holes in budgets, whether it be mm -hmm. the county budget or the city budget or the state budget. I think the reason we have traffic offenses is because that's determined to be the most safe way to drive. And when you have thousands of people on the road, you gotta have rules. And if you break the rules, there's enforcement. Um, we should find a better way to compel people to pay their tickets than to prevent them from driving when they're gonna do it anyway. And it's gonna cause a ripple effect that's all bad. All bad, and it, there's no evidence to show that spending license gets you more fines paid. It just is more punitive, you know? Well, in fact, uh, states like Ohio and California have, wait, when they held um, amnesty, years, <laughs> uh, got millions of dollars that uh, in unpaid fees and fines that they hadn't right. been getting because we people find were a, finally able to pay off those fines. We should find fees. a way to do that. Well, you know, and, and we passed a bill a couple of years ago uh, mm. to, to collect child support that way, if not suspended license and, and other things. I mean, that's, uh, while it's unfortunate, and uh, if it's in certain areas, maybe have it more than others. I, mean, I, I, I do agree, you know, again, I agree with my, my colleague and, and saying that it should not be used as a revenue source. It should be uh, to, uh, uh, to protect us all. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I uh, occasionally get stopped by the boys in blue and, <laughs> and you know, and, and, I pay, and, I, and I understand that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's simply a matter of, you know, let's, let's uh, try to do our best to, to obey those laws. But, you know, it, it also goes back to we got to make sure that we're doing uh, doing the right thing for everybody. Yeah. Well, and one of the suggestions that was raised as they were discussing this bill was adding an amendment that would uh, basically automatically take money out of wages or out of uh, tax returns to pay those fines and fees, as opposed to suspending. That, that might be yeah. in the end yeah. to get some, to get enough votes. Yeah. All right. Well, we're all hearing the music, which tells us we are out of time. Jim, Ken, like the Oscars, thank you. you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. I've enjoyed our discussion. I hope you have as well. We'd also like to thank our news partners at KSN News, Cake News, and the Wichita Eagle for sharing their materials with us. We can continue this conversation online. Just look for Pilar Pedraza TV or KPTS Channel 8 on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For now, have a great week.